What is it trying to solve? Why would you or I or anyone want something called software transactional memory? Uh, it turns out that writing things in a parallel fashion are really, really hard. Um, if you haven't done this, you just have to take my word on it. Um, so very intelligent people kind of put their heads together and said, what can we, can we come up with a pattern to simplify trying to do this? Um, the, one of the patterns they came up with is software transactional memory. Uh, so what is this pattern? Uh, let's break it down just by word, and this will give us a good idea. So software transactional memory is fundamentally just memory. So this isn't like a remote system, it's not a database somewhere, it's not an object framework. You're just trying to deal with the most basic operation of memory. Uh, software transactional memory is transaction. Uh, typically when you talk about transactions, you think databases and the ACID acronym. So in transactional memory, we get two of these typically four uh, aspects. Atomic, this means that anything done within a transaction Two other transactions look like looks like it happens either all at once or not at all. So no matter how many pieces of memory I touch or read from, if I'm another transaction, uh, from my perspective, all of your changes happen at the same time. Uh, we don't get consistency. Uh, it's not to say that we're inconsistent, but it's not imposing a data model on you. It's not imposing relations, anything like that, like databases do. Uh, isolated, no matter how many threads are running, any number of transactions. None of them have to worry about what is happening in the other transactions. To the global state of the system, it looks like each transaction is happening as if it's the only thing running the entire process. Uh, and durable, we're not writing to disk. Uh, if you crash or go away, so does your memory. Uh, and then software transactional memory, actually like we were just talking about, there is hardware transactional memory. Uh, Software transactional memory is implemented, so all of the magic I just talked about, entirely in memory. And so your code is basically hosted within usually another library. Uh, which kind of brings us to, so what does it look like? Generally, uh, the hand wavy, it's usually language extensions. And so there's you know, a big list of languages which have different levels of support. Um, but a lot of times it's like, so for C++ you need a special compiler with special flags and it'll compile your code and put all the special magic in there for you behind the scenes. Um, so here's a completely arbitrary set of code, but will hopefully kind of demonstrate the power of something like this. So we've got my function. Here's the one magic keyword. I say I want this block to be atomic. So I want everything in here to look as if it happens at once, and I don't want to care what else is going on in the system. So I've got my collection. I'm reading a couple values out of it, I don't care if someone is deleting entries from this collection. I don't care if someone's inserting collections. They can be trying to delete the exact keys that I'm looking up. I don't care. I don't want to lock this collection. I don't want to have to worry about managing any of that state. So uh, just to continue, I'm updating some global counter. I may be updating um, the objects themselves with this update loop. Again, the magic the transactional memory gives you is that <coughs> it's hosting all of these transactions and making it such that I don't have to worry who else is touching this memory that I'm using. Um, which if you've done kind of concurrent programming, this is kind of a magical thing. It seems like the best thing ever. Um, so why wouldn't you want to use this? Uh, to provide this magic of not having to care about what else is happening in the process, there is a very high chance that this block of code will be run multiple times in order to be actually applied to the global state of the program, um, which imposes a couple limits right off the bat, which is anything that imposes a side effect, so like sending over the network, not allowed. Uh, also, it means that if like, these updates take five seconds, you're running that potentially over and over to get to a place where the global state of the program accepts your, uh, your changes. Uh, so how does all of this magic work? Uh, in general, so there's a couple variations, but we'll go through a general approach. Uh, the system accesses all memory through level of indirection. So to access a logical block of memory, I need to go through a handle. And this lets us do a few things, but when I want to write, so I want to write a new value to a block of memory. The transactional system looks at the handle, looks at what the global state of it is, and makes a complete copy of that entire chunk of memory. It says, all right, here's your logical piece of memory. Update it as much as you want, read it as much as you want. 
only you transaction are going to see these changes. Um, reads, a similar thing, but we can just reference the original memory as long as all the transactions, like pinky swear not to touch it. Um, so we've done all of our expensive operations. We want to commit this, and we want it in an atomic way. Uh, and usually it's done through something called a two-phase commit. So first phase, we go through our transaction object, and for each kind of handle and memory block pair that we've accessed, we try and put our marker there and say, I would like to update the memory that you're pointing to. Um, this marker can only be placed basically in two cases. As long as the handle points to the original memory uh, that was there when we started this transaction, and no one else has their marker there. Again, there are variations on it, but you can try and go through all the handles and put your marker on these uh, handles that you've either read from or made copies of the memory. What if you can't? So I would go up through, I hit handle number five, and someone has either updated it or there's a transaction with their marker there. I have to throw away all of the copies of memory that I've done and all of the work that I've done. And this uh, ensures the, the locality, the isolation, because if I committed changes after someone else had modified something in the middle, then it, it doesn't make sense. You can't logically have those transactions appear as if they happened in sequence by a single process. Um, so you're basically making a huge bet with this kind of scheme that you'll be touching enough different parts of the program most of the time that you won't actually conflict and so you don't have to keep throwing away this work, these copies of memory, um, all this computation that you've done. Uh, so optimistically, we succeed. We've reserved all of our handles and said, I want to update these logical pieces of memory. I now make a second pass, well, I mark myself as complete, and then I make a second pass and do actually do the updates. And so anywhere I have written to the logical piece of memory, we just swap the handle. Um, in a safe way, which is also a little hand wavy. Uh, and the original memory gets garbage collected. Um, you can't delete it immediately because there may be read transactions, trying to read from this memory, um, which is another way you can uh, conflict and have to throw stuff away. So that was a lot of details. That's a lot of stuff to get kind of that magic that we talked about where you don't have to care about what else is happening in the program. So we talked about the side effects not allowed in transactions, running expensive operations multiple times. Also, it's not great for large blocks of memory. So for example, hash tables are really useful, but they're also kind of defined by this big contiguous block of memory. So if you wanted to update it in a scheme like this, you would have to copy the entire memory, copy the entire array, touch maybe just a few places, and then check that in as the new master, clean up all the rest. Uh, and then in practice, because your transactions are going to be potentially vary in their length of operation, you really still have to worry about priority and contention with these things. Um, basically, there's a uh, starvation that can happen if you've got one big transaction that wants to make a lot of updates, but lots of little ones are coming in and kind of picking at the memory that, that you want to touch in your big thing. Um, so who actually uses this? Apparently, the ladders. Um, I talked to Sean this morning, apparently there's an old piece of closure code in some library that used transactional memory, so that was pretty cool. Uh, but in general, it's, it's still kind of looking for its killer app. It was big like about 10 years ago, transactional memory. Uh, Microsoft, though, dropped support for its like, .NET extension in 2010. Uh, so generally, in production, used just around the edges in fancy edge cases. Uh, I can send this out after, but if you're really interested, I find all these things fascinating. This will cover kind of the basic building blocks for a system like this. This is actually a book that I read. But there's a free PDF online, and it'll actually teach you how to build a system like this. And then this was an interesting blog post by a guy who worked with transaction memory for years, and he's got kind of all the gotchas. That's it. Thank you.